this is something to think about. So, there's a game, and there's a victory within the game. But then there's the set of all games. And there's victory across the set of all games. And the victory that you attain across the set of all games isn't winning all the games. It's being invited to play all the games. And so if you play fair, then you're playing a metagame. And the metagame is how to win across the set of all games. And so if you teach your child how to behave properly, then they always get invited to play. And that makes them winners. And that's that. And so, if you understand that, you understand something phenomenally important about the emergence of morality. You know, because people, moral relativists in particular, think that morality is relative, you know. And, and of course, human beings are diverse, just like languages are diverse. And there's more than one playable game, but there's not really more than one playable metagame. It's like you're either the kind of person that other people want to play with, or you're not. And if you're not the kind of person that other people want to play with, then you're a loser. It's as simple as that. These first two key points that Jordan Peterson puts forward are going to serve as a good foundation on which we're going to build a very straightforward and very practical moral framework that approximates something like an objective morality. The central idea is that no matter what kind of society humans operate in, or in technical terms, no matter what social game humans play, if it's a functional society or functional social game, it has to be predicated on a number of universal principles, most notably fairness, which we'll get into in a moment. But before we get into that, let's start with an observation that in any culture, because it's humans involved, it's going to correspond to certain universal human behaviors. And that has to do with the fact that humans have similar bodies and brains. So every culture is going to have customs around food, gathering food, eating food, or social bonding, or anything that humans engage in on a universal basis. And anywhere humans do that, a common set of functional behavioral patterns or moral behavioral patterns are inevitably and naturally going to emerge. If you put enough people together in enough different places, the commonality of the groups of people, they're, because of the grounding in common motivation and mm -hmm. emotion and embodiment, mm -hmm. because we're embodied, means that they're going to generate hierarchies that are broadly similar, with strategies of success within those hierarchies that are broadly similar, mm -hmm. with descriptions of the strategies that are broadly similar. And so you could say, in some sense, the ethic that gave rise to the Enlightenment is in place more or less everywhere. Now, the evidence for this is relatively straightforward. If you accept that human beings are animals and subject to the forces of evolutionary selection, you also have to accept that there are objective parameters that condition what humans consider moral or immoral. At the most fundamental level, this is reflected in the notion that there is some objective sense of fair play. And we know this to be the case because human beings are very good at detecting cheaters, people who don't engage in fair play, and this intuition and the behaviors associated with it are so deep and evolutionarily grounded that we share them with primates. And then you could say as well, we're actually evolved to detect people who are good at playing the set of all possible games. And we actually know that, that's not theoretical. We know, for example, some things are easy to remember and some things are hard to remember, you know. Here's something that's easy to remember. You play with someone and they cheat. Man, you will remember that. That's like in your mind. That's not going anywhere. And an awful lot of social behavior is built around animals either trying to get away with something or spotting somebody else doing the same. An example of it, there is a test that's used in evolutionary psychology where you're given this very complicated story or another version of a complicated story where somebody promises if you do this, you'll get this reward, but if you do that, you're gonna get this punishment and like really complex. And in one outcome, the outcome of it is the person isn't supposed to get rewarded, but the individual decides to reward them spontaneous act of kindness. In another circumstance, the person is the individual is supposed to get rewarded and instead they get punished. A cheater in that case. And amid these convoluted stories, people are much better, 75% to 25, are much better at detecting when cheating has gone on in the story than when a random act of kindness has gone on. We are more attuned to picking up cheating. And remarkably, some very subtle studies have been done with chimps showing that chimps have the same bias. They are much better at picking up social interactions involving cheating than ones that involve spontaneous altruism. And so that's part of the innate 
morality system. You remember cheaters because they aren't good at playing the metagame. So how is this moral metagame defined? From a Darwinian or pragmatic perspective, which is the perspective Jordan Peterson takes, a good moral system is one that serves the genetic fitness of its practitioners. Peterson provides a straightforward definition here. Here's a way of thinking about it. Like a wolf pack, a wolf pack knows how to operate together. It knows how to hunt, right? And each wolf knows where every other wolf is in the dominance hierarchy. But they don't know they know that. They don't have rules, right? They don't have a code. They don't have laws. What they have is behavioral regularities, patterned behavioral regularities. And those are like a morality. They're very, very, in fact, that's exactly what they are. A dominance hierarchy of animals that aren't representational, you know, that don't have language. At least they don't have language. The dominance hierarchy is a kind of morality. It's a way of... It's a way of setting up individual behavior within a social context to maximize cooperation and minimize competition. So if you accept that evolution selects behaviors that increase genetic fitness, you can understand how evolution would condition and parameterize human culture and consequently ideas of morality. And what's absurdly interesting to know is that the cultural and moral ideas that were selected for by evolution, knowing when to play fair and knowing when someone isn't, for example, were ground into the neurobiology of our ancestors so much that we can observe how those behaviors and ideas are built into to the neurobiology of modern humans. So when you remember your past, that little movie that runs in your head, or maybe the facts that you can recite about your past, that's episodic memory. That's representational. But procedural memory is different. Procedural memory is how you walk. You don't know how you walk. That's how you ride a bike. It's how you play the piano. It's how you type. So it's, it's automatic, right? It's built into your nervous system. It's built into the nerves that innervate your musculature. So there's this dichotomy in sort of the neurobiology, neurobiology of learning between what is viewed as explicit learning and implicit. Explicit declarative learning, implicit procedural learning. Explicit declarative learning is you learn a fact, you know a fact, you know that you know the fact, you can consciously make use of the fact and strategize and use it in an executive way implicit procedural memory instead is stuff that, as always termed, your hands know better than your head does. So for example, you know, a child learns how to breastfeed, its mouth is pretty wired up right at birth, okay? And, and the rest of its body isn't wired up very much at all, but its mouth is. And you might think, well, that's just a reflex, and that Piaget would agree with that. It's a built-in, it's something built in that, that a baby can do right at birth. But even in the act of breastfeeding, the baby has to learn how to modify that reflex so that it gets along with its mother. So even at the very beginning with the most, you might think the most primordial acts, there's a sociological and influence and there's a mutual dynamic going on that's really, really important. It's really important. And so in some sense for Piaget, the structure of society is implicitly built into the structure of the procedural memory system. And so one of the things you might think about that, and Piaget makes much of this because he looks at the relationship between play and dreams and imitation. So he's kind of a quasi psychoanalyst. One of the things that means is that coded in your behavior, coded in your behavior is is, this, is the social structure in which you emerged. And it's coded in a way that you don't actually understand. You just know how to act. And because we are conditioned even as infants to engage in prototypically moral behavior, which is then reinforced in early childhood, as adults, our moral values are encoded so deeply within us that in many cases, we don't even think about them before we act, as evidenced in part by interviews done with people who engage in spontaneous acts of heroic behavior. And the second thing that always pops up is one that is the complete neurobiological logical outcome of that, which is when they then interview these people and say, you leapt out of this crowd and ran into this burning building and almost got yourself killed to save this child who you didn't even know. How, what, what were you thinking when you did it? And people's answer is always the same. I wasn't thinking. I didn't think before I knew it, I had run in there. Before I knew it, I had leapt into the river. What are we looking at here? We are looking at a moral act, not as the outcome of your frontal cortex wrestling you into being brave and moral and all of that. You were looking at an implicit pathway. 
You were looking at, I didn't think. Before I knew it, I had leapt in the river. You were looking at what happens when something is overlearned during childhood. It is not something that you have to sit and consciously wrestle with. Now, there is plenty of nuance and complexity that I am not either smart enough nor capable enough to integrate properly into a video like this. So I want to address a fundamental criticism of this moral framework head on. For better or worse, someone like Vosch, who is a moral anti-realist and would likely disagree with Peterson's position. To know Low Vosch, are you really saying Peterson is a fascist? Yeah. Yeah, 100. Yeah, of course. Offers a concise summary of a more relativistic and subjective approach to morality. Whereas a moral anti-realist is of the opinion that there's no such thing as an epistemically objective morality. My position is that there's no way to objectively determine, like in a universal sense, what is right or wrong. But if you arbitrarily decide on several axiomatic principles, like for example, uh, we should promote human well-being or species well-being, whatever, um, truth and knowledge are good, we should be considerate, like stuff like that, like stuff we choose. I think when we choose to value those things, we're being subjective. It's just what we feel is right. I don't think those are objective determinations. I think we're choosing to bias ourselves towards those beliefs. What Vosh gets wrong here is that people don't choose their values any more so than people choose what they're interested in. Try choosing to be interested in the video game you've played 10 times over already, or try choosing to be an extrovert if you're an introvert. The process by which, according to Vosh, people would arbitrarily agree on certain axiomatic principles, that process is affected by the socialization we underwent in childhood and infancy, and that process of socialization was selected for by millions of years of evolutionary forces and thus the entire sequence of processes is conditioned by objective parameters so we don't just subjectively agree on a set of axiomatic principles because the process by which we would evaluate and decide on those principles are objective processes occurring unconsciously that were selected and shaped for by evolution but there is an element of truth to the idea that because people vary so much not least in terms of personality What's moral for you in one moment might be immoral for me in a different moment, and that can give the illusion that it f fundamentally is subjective. Because, you know, relativists, modern relativists like to think of morality as something that's just arbitrary, like it's a cultural construction. You know, in society one thinks that A is bad, and society two thinks that B is bad, and when you get right down to it, there's no commonality underneath all that. But the existentialists sort of undercut all that, and they just say, well, what's immoral are those things that you could change that you do that result in outcomes that are catastrophic for you. That's it. That's what immoral is. And so that's universal, because it doesn't really matter what the details are. You know, like what you do that's immoral could be very much different than what you do. It might be temperamental. You know, we're each in our own playing field, in a sense. But there's a commonality underneath that, which is... Well, for example, you won't get away with deceiving yourself. You just can't. And the reason you can't is because you need a model of the world that's like the world. And if you try to live in a model of the world that isn't like the world, you'll just bump into the world. And so the, the deception brings with it its own punishment. And that's why it's immoral. The idea that morality could be temperamental, or in other words, dependent on your personality, is not only interesting, I actually think it is some evidence against, or potentially is evidence against, the Kantian idea of a categorical imperative. Like, if you're a people pleaser, and someone who's very high in agreeableness, and you've been pushed around your whole life, and you don't know how to establish boundaries, there might be situations where you need to overcorrect and say, look, I'm going to be an asshole to this person who's taking advantage of me, and I'm going to hurt their feelings. And you have to sort of commit to being an asshole because you haven't learned to draw the boundaries correctly and assert yourself. And thus, the only way to do it effectively is to overcorrect until you can learn where exactly to draw the line. And so in that case, being an asshole in that situation would be the moral thing to do because you need to stand up for yourself. Whereas someone else who might find themselves in a similar situation, although they aren't people pleasers and they know how to assert themselves, well, them being an asshole to just take advantage of someone or gain something in the short term, that would be immoral. And so obviously every situation that every person finds themselves in in any given moment is going to be unique. But the idea that people should act according to the maxim that you would wish all other rational people to follow as if it were a universal law, well, that doesn't necessarily make sense because not every person has the same personality type. And we actually evolved different personalities to fulfill different niches. Now, as Joe Rogan says, it's entirely possible that I'm wrong that morality is subjective, that this is merely an attempt to construct an objective morality out of a fundamentally subjective framework. 
and perhaps the scientific evidence that I cited is not convincing and maybe not even correct. Um, and all of this is merely an attempt to cement my power and this, this, and that, or whatever the moral relativists believe. But I don't think so. I think morality does have objective elements, and it's important to recognize that so we can push back against all of the immoral stuff that is happening in society. And so with that, good luck and Godspeed. Thank <music> you.